You're listening to Tone Benders, the Sound Designers Podcast. Let's do this. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Renee Coronado, and with me as always, it's Tim Muirhead. Hey, Tim. Hey, Renee. How's everybody doing today? Doing great. And we've got Teresa Morrow. Hello. And with us is the proprietor of De Facto Sound and the showrunner of 20,000 Hertz, the podcast. It is Dallas Taylor. Hey, Dallas. Hey, showrunner. I called hey. you showrunner. I, I, nice. Did I promote you? <laughs> I like it. I've never been called a showrunner before, but I will take that. We have a beautiful mutual admiration society going on because I've been listening to your podcast, 20,000 Hertz, since the very beginning as well. So Same here. Uh, it's great to hear your voice on our podcast. This is awesome. Hey, I'm super excited about this. I've been listening to this for so long, and here I am, my voice, on this podcast. That's weird. <laughs> Cross-podcasting. I'm excited to be here. So before we get to your podcast, let's talk about what your day job is. You've been running De Facto Sound for a good long while now. What, what is it that you do in De Facto Sound? What is, what is the day-to-day kind of work of what's going on over there? We have uh, five people on staff, and uh, it's me, the creative director, I guess you'd say, which is a weird thing in, in the sound world to call yourself, but uh, we don't really say that publicly, but, uh, but we're all sound people here. Uh, and then three sound designers and a producer, Sam. Sam's job is just getting things in and out and making sure that things are running smoothly. And then the the sound designers are all doing their ads and trailers and all that stuff. And I'm doing a lot of reviewing, meeting with people, a lot of FaceTime stuff, a lot of like creative calls ahead of time. So it's almost like a... I don't know, it's, a, it's kind of like a supervising sound edit, edit type of thing if you put it put that in the advertising world. So I spend most of my time reviewing things and uh, and kind of going, why don't we try this or why don't we try that or why don't we demo this other thing and, um, you know, this is a little muddy or, or, or whatnot. But I'm really fortunate because I basically just get to hear just incredible, incredible sound design uh, all day from just like, I don't know, five to ten spots a day uh, with all kinds of different um, groups. So we do... Tons and tons of like um, things like car spots and advertising stuff and shoe commercials and um, to like uh, lots of documentaries, branded documentaries, uh, feature documentaries, and then um, tons and tons where, where I kind of come out of is the TV world, the TV promo world, um, tons of like television promos uh, from, from like Discovery Channel where I used to work uh, through like uh, AMC or, or even like um, HBO, we're doing tons of uh, their trailers now and even some of those uh, big Game of Thrones trailers. And so um, so we're really fortunate. Uh, we're doing a lot of, of short pieces. Uh, so we just get to kind of uh, stretch into a lot of different variety all the time. And I get to hear it. Yeah, the short form is something we've been talking about recently as far as, as, as getting that voice on, on our podcast. Because the short, the short form, you, get, you still get to go deep and you get to do very interesting stuff. But the format is such that the, the turnaround is way different and the requirements are way different. Yeah, with um, the short form stuff, it's really been... I mean, I guess kind of traditionally, I'm speculating here, um, traditionally just the, the best talent in the world has really gravitated kind of from film down. Um, but, uh, and then with that, even with advertising, I think that that, you, that kind of showed itself for a long time because it was really just like narration, copy, music focused for the longest time. But now with how just um, huge and epic sound design is across the board in video games and film and television, advertising is really begging for it and, and screaming for like another aspect of storytelling. And so uh, we've seen a lot of success just by bringing that same film seriousness approach uh, to advertising. And so that's, um, you know, I think just like a lot of people, when I uh, was doing my time in L.A., I wanted to do the feature films and, and things like that. And but kind of got pulled into this like television promo world, which I ended up completely loving. And then um, once I went through the in-house jobs, um, uh, went out externally to do kind of that same thing for a lot of different networks. And yeah, one thing led to another. And then now I feel like we've really found our voice as this really thoughtful, analytical sound design company, almost like sort of agency-like, um, just due to how uh, involved creatively a lot of the projects are becoming. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I love it. It's something that like I am completely in love with exactly what I'm doing right now. And I have no kind of regrets of going in any other direction. There's just amazing people. Like there's some terrible people in adver- advertising too, but like just in the <laughs> promo world and advertising, there's, there's good people, really good people. And, um, and that's another thing. Like I've been fortunate enough that we've been, we've seen enough success that I can kind of, you know, scoot away the people that 
we really don't want to work with. So um, we have a really good base of people, of collaborators and stuff now. And then somehow on top of that, you managed to produce a podcast, which to me sounds like a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah, it definitely feels like another full-time job. It's a show about sound. The tagline is the stories behind the world's most recognizable and interesting sounds. Uh, so it's super highly uh, crafted, super highly produced. Um, there's writers, there's sound designers. Um, we use music and all kinds of sound to kind of tell these stories of anything from like the beeps and bloops on your phone to like how your brain works with certain sounds or like the restaurants are too loud or like how our brains are in tune with nature. Things uh, to really get people in tune with their sense of hearing. And since you're here in a podcast player, most likely, you should go search for it, which is 20,000 hertz. It's all letters, so there's no numbers in it. So it's T-W-E-N-T, et cetera, 20,000 hertz. And if any person is listening to Tone Benders, which you are right now, I promise you, you will like it. So please go subscribe. Yes, good idea. Go to his website and subscribe to the podcast. How long have you actually been doing the podcast for now? The podcast came along over three years ago, just because I'm a big fan of podcasting in general. It was more than just being a fan of podcasts. It was that I wanted to just tell stories about sound on a much higher level. I think we can all relate to the idea that, you know, what we do is just really cool, but the rest of the world is just completely blind to it and just don't get it. And so I didn't necessarily want to want to talk particularly about the industry, but I was trying to figure out like what stories are out there that like my grandmother would start to identify how I think and what stories are out there that like young people, um, you know, people who might not traditionally be the mold of what goes into sound and engineering and stuff like what, what kind of stories would appeal to them to kind of get them into this world. And then also just the fact that, you know, we have five senses, five very important senses and and four of them, sight, taste, touch, smell, all four of those fronts. If you think about every single one of them, like we're ultra visual creatures. You can't look anywhere without something being designed to the nth degree. Um, you know, touch the chairs that we're sitting in the HVAC, you know, we're, we're you know, the comfort level that we're in. We have um, smell, you know, if your sewage smelled like you would get it fixed very quickly. So things smell good. And if you if it smells bad, then you, you fix it. And then, um, uh, oh, taste. Yeah, we, we eat stuff all day and probably too much. And we curate what we like and what we dislike. But we don't treat sound like that at all. We think of sound, uh, I think as a, as a culture, we think of sound as being, you know, music and nothing else. And that's just not at all true. So there's this giant gap in hearing just the world around you from being nature to just the thing, the environments that you put, put yourself in to understanding stress and uh, the way that your mind works. Uh, that is just this giant gap that, that just there's not a lot of information out there. And so I wanted to tell those, those stories, at least start to get people in tune with the sense of hearing. So, um, you know, I thought about visual and all that stuff, but I also felt that like just doing something visually in that space would just cast another giant shadow on audio. And I didn't want anything to cast the shadow on the thing that's the most important in this. So, um, you know, thinking through that, I was like, it just has to be a podcast. I love podcasts, but it was really like the stories forced it to be a podcast because I didn't need any other senses to kind of, again, take center stage and push audio to the background. That was like the genesis of that. I'd been thinking about it for years and years and years, but really started to get in production at the beginning of 2016. Had a handful of episodes I thought would be cool. The first two, which the first one was the voice of Siri, and the second one was the NBC chimes, um, the stories behind those. Those two took about nine months to make um, because we just didn't know what we were doing. And, And it's funny if you go back and listen to them, like there's a lot of flaws with it, but they're only like probably less than 15 minutes each. And so um, that's how much it was like toiled over like every split second of it. So I personally can't even listen to those because we've just uh, we've just uh, gotten so much better over time. I've gotten better as as trying to communicate. Um, You know, I had to kind of just put myself out there and, and try it. Uh, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a big fan of like things like Radio Lab and NPR shows and um, uh, 99% Invisible. I was really fortunate because I knew the host of 99% Invisible from the very beginning of his show. Um, like I kind of started listening to his show 
back on like episode eight or nine or something and um, just happened to be at a GDC one year and said, um, hey, Roman, like I'm going to be I'm going to be in San Francisco for this video game thing. I'd love to just, you know, hang out and maybe grab dinner. And he was super cool and said, sure. And then from that point, like seven years went by and we just like, I don't know, commented on each other's like kid pictures on Facebook. Um, but then I made a podcast and it was on his radar and he was like, I think I'll put it, you know, I think I'll play your show on my show. And then of course it went from like, you know, I think the first episode was like 200 people of my, you know, 200 of my friends that listened to it. And then like 250 of my friends that listened to it. And then it went on 99% invisible. And then it, the third, at the same day as the third episode. And then it was just like a hockey stick, like straight up. And so it went from like nothing to like, at the time, I mean, it got featured by so many places. It was like hundreds of thousands of like listens suddenly. And so I was super fortunate that that, I don't know, the podcast gods rained down on that. Uh, it wouldn't have gone past 10 episodes at the time. Uh, I was spending a ton of money because like every, all the writers, the sound people, the tape sinkers, the recording studios, like everything I like vowed that like, this is my passion project. I'm not going to have anybody else, um, you know, go without on this. And so, uh, so I was spending a ton of money to do it, uh, kind of out of the, out of the company, a lot of stress and all that stuff. But, um, Thankfully, it clicked, and thankfully, it clicked with the right people. NPR uh, featured it and did a lot of support. A lot of press hit that too, and so, um, so really, I feel like now it's just like a vessel for getting sound and hearing out to normal general audience, and that's the goal: is just to get people in tune with the with their sense of hearing. Yeah, my experience with your show was, and I also have been listening from the beginning and I, I immediately was like, oh, uh, I've listened to my Radio Lab episode. I've listened to my 99% Invisible episode. What am I gonna listen to next? And, and then your show came along and I was like, oh, this really fits into that sort of m frame of mind of like um, curiosity and stuff. And it's also kind of very specific to my interests as well. What I've found in this is that normal people are super into sound. People love it. Yeah. People love the stories. People love that opening up of a new sense. They love to think about it. Um, but I also think that there's been a little bit of uh, gatekeeping in audio in general that's kind of kept people from feeling like it's okay. And it's not only just in audio, but it's just in music too, like audiophile gatekeeping. Like uh, sometimes I'll see stuff on the internet. And I'll just be like, here's, you know, I'll retweet it. Audiophile gatekeeping. Everyone has an opinion and their, their opinions are valid. Um, but, uh, but I've seen a lot of just discouragement in the world of like, just like, oh no, you can't do that because you don't have, you don't have like gold plated XLRs connected to your like blah, 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 this, that, and the other. And it's like, no, none of that stuff really matters. Uh, I mean, sure it matters to some people, but, um, but there's a lot of that audiophile gatekeeping that I'm just, I'm just trying to stay, I don't do anything negative on the show or anything I'll, because we're, we're friends here and we're all audio people. I'll say it, but I try to stay like super positive, like not negative. It's super clean show because I want children to listen to it. I want like, um, you know, older people to listen to it and just be, just be able to have, have conversations. So when people tell me that like, oh, I listened to this on a road trip with my seven-year-old and we got to talk about, you know, this, this cool sound thing. And then that brought up another sound thing. And then we started discussing that. It's like, all right, that's where like sound should be. And I'm, uh, and, and there's, it's also funny now that like we've been established enough that like we'll do a show and then I'll see like three major publications about a week or two later do a story on the same thing. So, um, and, and, you know, I'm, I don't know if that came directly from the show or buzz or whatever, but it's just really exciting to see like little roots are like starting to permeate and people are starting to get into it. And I'm starting to see it in different places. And of course, we're not the only people doing this, but it's just neat to see. I, I just think this is the next frontier. Like the next frontier in luxury is sonic luxury. Like when people think about the way that their environments sound and it's coming and I can't wait. To me, it's a literacy. Yeah. Like you're saying, like your grandparents you know, they might be literate in how to use a camera or something like that. But I think with your show, it brings the issue of sound into kind of mainstream discussion. Where as a, I think it was always kind of sort of a quirky thing. Like occasionally you'd see a piece on TV or like at the end of the newscast about like some quirky sound thing. But it was always a kind of like this fringe interest. Um, I have a really cool story of listening to your show with someone else uh, I was listening to the uh, beatboxing episode while I was making breakfast for my six-year-old son, and he came in and asked what I was listening to, 
and now he walks around saying boots and cats and boots and cats and boots and cats. And <laughs> so he, that, that's how he beat boxes, which is uh, straight from your episode, which is awesome. It's so funny when I hear those type of things. I just remember like that show being so hard. And then also <laughs> it was being so hard. It was such a hard show to make. And then, and then like at the end, we were like so ready for it to be done. And what's fa- f- fascinating is like we spend about 150 to 200 hours plus on every single episode. Um, but some of them are just so hard to get there to feel right. And then that was one where we, when we named it Boots and Cats, it was almost just like in protest of how hard the show was. We're just going to make <laughs> it a really dumb name. It's funny. Like, and the other thing that's great is like even some of the hardest shows that we've ever made will go out and people, it's their favorite show. And um, when I ask people what their favorite show is or if I meet somebody, it's always totally different. And uh, that's what's cool. Like some people like just won't get into a certain episode and then other people are like, that's, that's what like hooked me on, on the show. Um, so it's neat. It's like resonating with people in totally different ways and it's all intentional. Um, it's all like purposeful to, to keep, uh, if, if you look at the title, like even the topics of the show, they're, they kind of jump all over the place. I mean, I personally love like the film TV type of things because that's my my thing. But then I also just know that I can get too in the weeds uh, with it with the audience. So I have to like force myself to find something that I'm just kind of interested in that's that's outside of that as well. What I find with your show is like the new episode will come out and I'll be like, that's this thing that's been in my head forever. And I've always kind of wondered about it, but I never really put it into words that that was a thing that I always thought about. And now there's this episode which explains it all. And I'm always kind of like, how do they come up with all of these ideas? Oh, man. Because you've done like over 60 episodes now. It's really just curiosity. It, you know, we're also really fortunate because the show's gotten to a point where we've been like fully advertised on. And so that's bring, bringing in revenue. And, and now we have like a cash flow. And it's, it's like we know that we have like a sustainable business model on the podcast. So now it's just amazing because like we can think up all these crazy ideas and listeners send them in too. We have a, a place where we put all of the show ideas and it's at like 400 uh, show ideas right now. So it's infinite. The show could go on forever. What's cool about it is like now we get to pick from just like 400 incredible ideas and then we all sit around and go like, well, what's just the most interesting thing? Well, did you hear this thing about this or did you read this thing about this? And we're like, you know what? We'll just do a show on it. And so that also feeds into like the day job too, because I think that a lot of what we're doing with the podcast is really like research into how we're executing on our, like the de facto sound side. It's a really reciprocal thing and it's all on purpose. Like the two are supposed to kind of like intermingle. It's like our education for kind of like depth of choices of what we're doing over here and how the brain works with certain certain things. Um, so yeah, we just try to be all over the place. Like sometimes we're really psychological. It's really like brain science stuff. And then sometimes it's really topical and sometimes it's just dumb. And um, <laughs> But it's all super highly produced. And uh, and that's another thing is I feel like we, we have a obligation. We all feel this way. We have an obligation as much as we possibly can to be the best sounding podcast in the world because it's about sound. And we want, if anybody comes to it, to like have that like expectation that like uh, the podcast about sound has to be incredible. And, uh, and also just very exciting thing, just cause it just hit my brain is we want a Webby for that too, as the best. <laughs> yeah. So the, so we won like the people's choice for like best sound design slash original music, which I can rant about because those are two totally different things, but we did win it. So <laughs> anyway, we have a lot of guests that have overlapped, that have been guests on both of our podcasts. So Ann Krober was on an episode of yours, and we had a whole episode with her. Yeah. Mark Mangini, Damian Kaspauer, Gordon Hempton. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, there's a lot of overlap, but our shows are also completely different. It's interesting because our audiences are interested in the same thing, but they're totally different. Um, and we're both interested in the exact same things, but we're, we're communicating it to different types of people. And that's why I love your show, is because like when I hear things on this show, I, it like speaks to, it's deep and it's like speaks directly to like the sound designer brain, but it's cool because it'd be, I think it'd be fun to actually listen to like, like the Ann Krober on tone benders and then like Ann Krober on 20,000 Hertz, just in the, the, the style, you could almost have the exact same interview. Um, it's just a matter of like stylistic approach and who you're trying to communicate with. And that's, um, that's uh, that's fun. I mean, it's fun to do that. It's fun to like craft all of those things, and it's fun to see just how much overlap there are on 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 even our shows. Did you make up the term bouge? <laughs> no, that was um, Craven Morehouse, which is not a real name. 
Uh, so Craven Morehouse was the guest on the the Bouge episode. The whole episode was based on something that his YouTube channel did. Uh, the YouTube channel is incredible. It's called Aural Knots, like an astronaut, but A U R A L Aural Knots, and they do a lot of videos. It's like what if I had a YouTube channel? That's probably what I would do with my life. Um, but they're really silly, and they use sound in really bizarre ways to just completely change the tone of things. They had one video that was called like how to make a blockbuster movie trailer. And I was so fascinated with it because it was so like, I'd never heard the term bouge. I'd kind of heard the, the term bois, but it's not like I'm searching sound minor for those terms at all. It's kind of like a such a um, generic pop culture type of term for it. And I, I don't know. It was one of those things I was like, this is going to fall so flat uh, to the world to do a show called the bouge. Um, but then as we put it together, it was like, oh my goodness, this, this, this is what the world needed is to like hear this. And it's got so ruins trailers. Uh, it ruins so <laughs> many trailers after you, after you really identify that bouge sound. I know the problem is you listen to that episode and you're like, I gotta start using that more. And then you're like, no, I can't use it anymore at all. <laughs> I, I used it repeatedly during stars playoff stuff. I was making stuff go like constantly. Oh, so. it sounds awesome. I just did. We just did like a, uh, some, I don't even know what show it was for. But we did like an HBO trailer like two days ago. And, uh, and I was so blown away. In 30 seconds, they used three distinct bouges. <laughs> I mean, it sounded cool, but it was just amazing. Like, how many bouges can you squeeze into something before people start to notice? So if we haven't clarified this, like, I don't think we've actually clarified. The bouge, the bouge is like the sound of a trailer, um, you know, when something is revealed and they're trying to get the, like, sinking feeling in your stomach. We've all used it the big bass drop you know you have kind of like the han zimmer blah that's like the punctuation when something big happens and then it's just like you know they're gonna destroy the world and i use it all the time yeah um, <laughs> as we all do <laughs> and the reason that i love that episode in particular is because uh, you can really see what the style is now i think when people think of trailers and you make trailers and we work for tra you know we do trailers just for a living all the time on the game side and TV side mostly, um, like everyone just wants to be as epic as humanly possible. And it's in my theory with this is like, it's like loud and quiet. It's like loud can't be loud without quiet. Quiet can't be quiet without loud. You have to have some sort of dynamic range to even identify one or the other. But generally, like trailers are kind of just designed to be just loud and epic all the time. And it's like, well, where do we go from here when it's all loud? And it's just like, then you like distort it and you put bass, bass dives and you do all this stuff. It's kind of become hysterical once you identify it, just how epic everything is trying to sound. And you can see that, like, I think that we're going to look back into this 10-year time period as, like, just like we look back at the 90s. If you think of, like, a 90s trailer, it's just like, Jack Smith and his wife, da-da-da-da-da, did the da-da-da-da-da. And then it's just like, piece of dialogue bite, piece of dialogue bite, and then the narrator. And they, you know, until one day, they da-da-da-da-da. It's, like, so easily identifiable as, like, a 90s trailer. I think... And 10 years from now, we're going to look back and go, oh, it has the bouge, it has the bois, it has the cover song, like it, it's all just, you know, there. And, and it'll be a new form in 10 years from now. And it has to be because you just can't go further, like with the epic. I mean, maybe you can. Maybe that should be what we all try to do. It, it, yeah, what's the next bouge? How do you make it more epic than what trailers are now? I don't know. Craven said this in the show, but like, I do hope that there's some trailer editors going like, dang it, they got our format. Like, we can't just keep doing this forever. What are we going to do? Uh, so I hope that that they're, they're kind of doing that. Interestingly, most of the trailer editors are the ones putting those things in. Yep. They're, they're a little bit like cuss words. If you use it too much, they lose their effectiveness. Exactly. I like that. You need dynamic range in your cursing as well. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> use it when you need it to be effective. <laughs> all right. Well, with all that in our heads, you know, you so graciously provided us with that episode to, to jump on this podcast. So um, thanks again for jumping on. Thanks so much for, for talking to us about DeFacto Sound and, and about what you're doing with 20,000 Hertz. And uh, let's check out the bouge. When you think about how a movie trailer sounds, what comes to mind? Does it sound something like this? In a land of eternal beauty and infinite mystery, a legend was born. This is the trailer from the 2000 film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. In it, you have all of the ingredients of a classic trailer. The story of a warrior. Including the legendary voice of Don LaFontaine. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. 
the only thing that could possibly take this trailer over the top is the classic intro, In a World. In a world without gas. In a world that's powered by violence. In a world of falafel. This is the classic recipe for a movie trailer, right? Well, not really. Movie trailers don't really sound like that anymore. A boomy voice of God is pretty rare nowadays. Trailers now really sound a lot more like this. And you've got this sound that can only be described as the booge. You know, the booge. You usually hear it before or after the more obvious blah. And after listening to this episode, you'll start hearing the booge everywhere. The booge is a term that I think we we just made it up. It's the term that we use for the subwoofer shaking low frequency drops that usually happen at about the peak of some catastrophic event in a trailer. That's Craven Morehouse, co-creator of the Arl Knots. It's a YouTube channel that uses sound to make fun of and recontextualize films and trailers. We like to make sound a little more transparent to the point of creating something comical, but also to highlight how important sound can actually be. The bouge can also be called a bass drop or a sub drop. Today, you can count on the bouge occurring in just about every suspenseful action movie trailer. I'm going in. To us in the trailer, that's when you're seeing the biggest thing happen. This would be a planet exploding or a building collapsing. So why do so many trailers use the bouge and other super aggressive sound effects? You have to consider that trailers are a form of advertising. That's James DeVille, a music professor at Carleton University. His project is called Trailerality and it studies the effects of music and sound in movie trailers. As a form of advertising, they're convincing people of going to movies. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not so good, though. And people should be aware of the power of music and sound in uh, trying to uh, persuade them. The movie industry brings in around $40 billion a year, and that's in the U.S. alone. It's a giant, highly competitive business. Every second of sound and music is maxed out to keep your attention. To really prove how much sound can change the tone of a movie trailer, you don't have to go very far. Simply searching for a recut trailer on YouTube brings up a ton of amazing fan-made trailers. Some of these are serious, but tons are taking a film in one genre and making it seem like it came out of another. Take, for example, this Elf trailer, where it's turned into a thriller. All right, uh, let's get it over with. i buddy the Elf. And here's a trailer for Dumb and Dumber, but with the score from the Inception trailer. <laughs> I'm talking about a little place called Aspen. On the other end of the spectrum, here's a trailer that perfectly parodies 90s family drama trailers, but it's for The Shining. Meet Jack Torrance. I'm outlining a new writing project. He's a writer looking for inspiration. Lots of ideas. No good ones. Meet Danny. He's a kid looking for a dad. There's hardly anybody to play with around here. Nah. What's up, Doc? These parodies prove just how critical sound is in a trailer. However, trailers obviously didn't always sound like this. So, let's rewind and go on a journey from the very first trailers to the ones we know today. The very first trailer in a movie theater came in 1913 in New York City. Interestingly, this trailer wasn't even for a movie. It was for a Broadway musical called The Pleasure Seekers. But this idea of creating a trailer quickly swept the movie industry. Soon, theater projectionists everywhere were adding them to the end of their film reels, hence the word trailers. They were traditionally at the end of the main feature. Early on, before sound could be married to picture, trailers were accompanied by music, with big lines of text appearing on screen between key scenes. These giant lines of text were the early form of a narrator. It gave all of the necessary plot points. 
Of course, this was mainly because films didn't have dialogue yet. But even after dialogue came to films, trailers kind of remained the same. That was because, basically, only one company was making all of the trailers. In the 1920s, even before sound, there was one company that managed to gain a monopoly by signing various studios to create trailers, the National Screen Services, NSS. So by the time sound comes, they're creating most of the trailers. With the addition of sound and films, the NSS added an iconic element to trailers, voiceover narration. Casablanca, city of hope and despair, located in French Morocco in North Africa. The meeting place of adventurers, fugitives, criminals, refugees, lured into this danger-swept oasis by the hope of escape to the Americas. But the NSS was formulaic. The narration, music, and titles all looked and sounded the same. There was a fairly strong uniformity across the boards, and the kind of music that they would use starting in the 30s then tended to be very dramatic. But these were also tracks that would wander from one trailer to another. Everything changed when the NSS lost its monopoly. This was around the mid-50s when boutique trailer houses started popping up. This new competition pushed trailer editors to get more creative. Pardon me, sir, but what are you looking at? Is that by any chance the picture called the Pink Panther? They would contract out sound and music from independent producers of music the trailer house then would license the music they need for the trailer. They would produce the trailer and then send it to the studio. Fast forward to the 80s, and suddenly the same booming narrator voices are popping up everywhere. There were two voiceover artists who had probably 90% of the market in the 80s and 90s and in the 2000s. Hal Douglas and Don LaFontaine. I'm sure you'll remember these voices. This is Hal Douglas. Men in black, protecting the Earth from the scum of the universe. And this is Don LaFontaine. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. This time, he's back for good. These two voices dominated trailers for decades. But from the year 2000 to 2010, these voice of God type of narrators pretty much disappeared. The movie industry had used this formula for so long. It was becoming so obviously cliche to both the public and the film industry. It was Jerry Seinfeld that might have been the one to finally kill off the classic movie trailer voice. The trailer for his 2002 film Comedian basically made fun of the entire trailer industry. It starred none other than Hal Douglas poking fun at himself. In a world where laughter was king. Uh, no in a world, Jack. What do you mean, no in a world? It's not that kind of movie. Oh? Okay. In a land that... No in a land either. In a time... Nah, I don't think so. In a land before time. It's about a comedian, Jack. The other thing that killed narration in trailers was the internet. Before YouTube, people only really saw trailers at the movies. They only had one shot. The narration helped audiences get the story in a single viewing. Today, we tend to watch trailers multiple times. There's a lot less need for narration. So now, because of all this, the sound effects and music started to take a more prominent place in trailers. For example, that iconic bois noise you've heard in every trailer since inception. It has a ton of variations. Pair these epic effects with the cover of a well-known song, and you've got yourself some movie trailer magic. The world. To get people on board with this trailer, we're going to recontextualize something to get you excited. So oftentimes people will do orchestral or symphonically, you know, trailerized versions of a popular song and usually an unexpected song. The cover song trope started becoming popular around 2010. Here's a Belgian girls choir cover of Radiohead's Creep for the social network. Don't care if it hurts. I wanna have control. I wanna 
That was perhaps the cover song that really started that revolution. This trailer was so popular that producers hired the same choir to do covers for many other trailers. Here they are covering Metallica's Nothing Else Matters that was featured in the Zero Dark Thirty trailer. And here's Gang of Youth covering David Bowie's Heroes in the Justice League trailer. And here's Destiny's Child Survivor in the Tomb Raider trailer. Now, when I hear it, I think, not again. These movie trailer cliches are so common that it's easy to parody. And it's not just the bouge or the bois or the cover song, but it goes even deeper. I think what happened was we just started noticing certain tropes that were used so ubiquitously that it was becoming funny to us. Trailers have become so formulaic that Craven and his Arl Knotts partner Zach Kuntz decided to pack them all into one glorious mega parody trailer. We'll deconstruct that trailer, as well as teach you how to make your very own bouge after this. We're in an age of the biggest and boomiest trailers ever. These trailers sometimes try so hard to be so epic that they border on self-parody. Craven Morehouse and Zach Kuntz make silly videos using sound for their YouTube channel. They're collectively known as the Arl Knots. In some ways, we're trying to make a commentary that does have some comedic value, but also gets people possibly interested in what the function of sound is. In the 80s and 90s, trailers were dominated by deep, gravelly-voiced narrators. Now, we're in a sea of bois and bouges. We just were thinking that people were leaning on that sound effect just too hard. But there is no denying how cool it can be when it happens. You know, you feel it in your core. Our brains are wired to have a survival response to strong, low frequencies. Low-frequency sounds trigger fear responses, like rumbling thunder or a lion roar. But how exactly is this sound made? The fundamental of most bouges are made by some sort of basic wave, a common choice being a sine wave, which has no harmonics. Then you give it a nice smooth pitch down. But you could also use a square wave, a sawtooth wave, or a triangle wave. But that's just the bones of bouge creation. Sound designers can make them a bit punchier by adding a kick. A bit more aggressive by adding distortion. Or you could add a chorus or double it. The bouge possibilities are seemingly endless. Craven and Zach made a YouTube video called How to Make a Blockbuster Movie Trailer. In it, they explore all of the tropes you tend to see in a modern trailer. Of course, we have the bouge, but as they dove deeper into these sonic tropes, they discovered more and more. So right out of the gate, we start with the single note trope. Which feels like a good way to get the viewer on board with something that is possibly foreign to them. So right at eight seconds, we introduce another sound effect beyond the single note, which is the low bois. Usually the low bois is sort of the call and response to the single note trope. Dialogue has its tropes too. So the thing that we're trying to juggle here, obviously, with adding dialogue is to give the viewer the impression that this template crosses many levels. Have you ever wondered about this particular thing? Because it turns out that that thing is real. At about this point in the trailer, oftentimes the music that has been following, you know, the action thus far in the trailer then blossoms into what is a recognizable cover of a song that typically has not been covered before. Spin me right round, baby, right round, like a record, baby, right round, round, round. 
we landed on You Spin Me Around because that song is so hyper ridiculous and awesome. The idea that it would be used as the most dramatic song for a trailer was about as abstractly ridiculous as we could get. It just immediately felt perfectly stupid. You get people hooked and then you, you do some sort of tonal shift that introduces a problem or a bad guy or some sort of conflict. You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? When you have a rhythm, a pulse going, and then it's da, 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 da. The triplet can be really effective, but for some reason in trailers, that's the hottest thing ever, is a triplet locked to like visuals, snapping in at the same moment. The climax of the trailer is punctuated by not one, but two bouges. I don't think I'm the one. I'm not the person who can stop this thing. You are that person. Now take my hand! Run! It's like, why a second bouge? Like, that's as ridiculous as, as it can get. After the double bouge rise, it's time to start bringing this trailer home. So, of course, everything has to build to a head. The music will pause, breathe for a minute, and usually within that breath, sonically, there's a character bite. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. We went with the secondary statement from a bad guy. I am the reaction. And then give you that last single note smash in the face for the title reveal. One final iteration of the chorus, which even feels more stupid. While trailers are boomier than ever before, this certainly isn't the first time that they've all sounded the same. The 30s had many of the same overly dramatic music tracks. The 80s and 90s were dominated by two deep aggressive voices. Today's trailers have the bois and the bouge. With that in mind, what will future trailers sound like? I'd like to see more original music and music that doesn't sound like it's taken off of the shelf and reused. Usually what happens is somebody does something way outside the box and then people latch onto it and then it just becomes the new thing that people are doing. You can almost imagine some movie trailer producers watching that video and saying, okay, these guys just blew it for the next six months <laughs> for us. <laughs> and now here's how to make a blockbuster movie trailer by Oral Knots in its entirety. Have you ever wondered about this particular thing? Because it turns out that that thing is real. thing I referred to earlier, well, it's happening, and it will destroy us all. Someone has to stop this thing. And that someone is you. You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? I'm the one. I'm not the person who can stop this thing. You are that person. Now take my hand! Run! For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I am the reaction.
destruction. Oh, I love that episode, The Bouge. It's so good. If you want to hear more episodes of 20,000 Hertz, you can go to ToneBendersPodcast.com, navigate to the page for this episode, and we've listed links to some of our favorite episodes, uh, ones that we just really like, as well as ones that feature past guests of ToneBenders interviews. So there's Ann Krober, Damian Kaspauer, Mark Mangini, uh, and many, many more. So go to our website, and you can find links to those. You will also find a link on how to subscribe subscribe to 20,000 Hertz. And I highly suggest you do that because you won't want to miss a future episode. It's a really good show that takes a subject that I think everyone listening to Tone Benders is super familiar with. It's something we went to school for. It's something we work with every day. It's our careers. But they take the stuff that we're intimately familiar with and make us look at it from kind of different angles and different perspectives. And I think it really adds to my creativity and how I approach my work. And it's something that I think everyone listening to Tone Benders would really uh, benefit from by adding it to their playlist. So go to ToneBendersPodcast.com, navigate to the page for this episode, and then you will find a link on how to subscribe, as well as many episode links to 20,000 Hertz, some of our favorite episodes from the past. And uh, while you're subscribing to 20,000 Hertz, if you haven't subscribed to Tone Benders, come on, subscribe to Tone Benders too. You're listening to us. Come on, give us a subscription. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening and we will see you next time. We took a little summer break there. You might've noticed your feed hasn't been updated in a couple weeks, but we are back now. We have lots of episodes coming down the pipes. We're doing so many interviews in the next little while that it's kind of overwhelming. Actually, some really cool stuff is coming. So stay tuned, stay with us and uh, tell your friends about 20,000 Hertz and tell your friends about Tone Betters. We really appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Tone Benders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 